Hey everyone, how are you doing? My name is Wendy Myers of MyersDetox.com and I'm so excited to talk to you guys today. We have an amazing interview. We have Dr. Ali Cohen and uh, she is a, a medical doctor, a rheumatologist and an expert on toxins. And we had such a fun time going back and forth today and we're gonna be talking about how chemicals wreak havoc on your hormones and weight loss. Uh, we're gonna talk about a lot of different tips. She's got a new book out called Non-Toxic and just a wealth of tips and tricks in that book uh, to help you live a, you know, a healthier, non-toxic lifestyle. And we're gonna go into a lot of those tips today on the show. But we'll also talk about the specific ways uh, that toxins inhibit weight loss and cause weight gain, how they inhibit stem cells and cause stem cells to make fat cells and and why you know we think that the obesity epidemic is not necessarily what people are eating the number of calories is the toxins also are playing a major role we'll talk about the problem with hand sanitizer and, and disinfectants that companies everywhere are going nuts with and what you don't know about them is harming your immunity We'll talk about the insidious nature of toxins and how something you can't see causes so much harm. We're gonna talk about why your hormones are a mess and how the most common chemicals do the most damage to our hormones. And we'll discuss how drinking water has only 91 chemicals removed out of the 90 thousand in our environment. What? And we'll talk about why teenagers are at the most risk group for chemical exposure. We'll, we'll explain why and what you can do to help educate your teenagers. They want to hear this information and how the most lasting damage from toxins began when you were in utero growing in your mother's stomach and how to have a healthy child and a healthy pregnancy. We'll also discuss the health issues, namely autoimmune that toxins cause, and we go over the problems with vapes, so a topic I haven't talked about before. So I know you guys listening to this show are really concerned about toxins in your body, you know, wondering about your body burden of toxic metals and what to do about those, how to get those toxins out of your body. So I created a quiz. It's called heavymetalsquiz.com. Take a two minute quiz and you get a totally free video series that talks about all your most frequently asked questions like, you know, what supplement should I take to detox? How long does it take to detox? What kind of test should I do? And many, many more videos that answer all of your, all of your burning questions you have to figure out how to detox and feel better in your life, have more energy and less brain fog, more mental clarity, more happiness and joy. So our guest today, Dr. Ali Cohen, she is a board certified rheumatologist and integrative medicine specialist, as well as an environmental health expert in Princeton, New Jersey. She has collaborated with the Environmental Working Group, Cancer Schmancer, I love that name, and other disease prevention organizations, and as a co-editor of the textbook, Integrative Environmental Medicine. And in 2015, she created thesmarthuman.com to share environmental health, disease prevention, and wellness information to the public. She lectures nationally on environmental health topics for elementary, high schools, colleges, universities, medical schools, and physician training programs. And she's a regular expert guest for television, print, and podcasts. In 2015, she received the New Jersey Health Heroes Award in Education for the Smart Human Educational Platform. And she was awarded the 2016 Burton L. Eichler Award for Humanitarianism. And Dr. Cohen is working to educate and empower the next generation to make safer, smarter lifestyle choices through the creation of, of environmental health and prevention curricula for schools nationally. Her TEDx talk, How to Protect Your Kid from Toxic Chemicals, can be found on YouTube, and you can follow her health and wellness tips and recommendations on Facebook at The Smart Human, Twitter and Instagram at The Smart Human. You can also sign up for The Smart Human newsletter at thesmarthuman.com. Dr. Ali Cohen is the co-author of a new consumer guidebook we discuss on the podcast today, Non-Toxic, 
guide to healthy living and a chemical world. And non-toxic is part of the Dr. Andrew Weil Healthy Living Guides. You can learn more about Ailey and her work at AileyCohenMD.com. Well, Dr. Cohen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me here. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and how you got into, uh, you know, all things non-toxic. Well, I stumbled into it. It was not by choice. I really do believe I'd be a conventional Western rheumatologist if it wasn't for the fact that my dog had gotten really sick uh, back in 2000. God, I can't even remember. Was it 2007 or eight? And he was a really just a beautiful dog. I was a young mom with two young kids, really young kids. And he was my dog. And he you know, was four and a half years old, got really ill. We thought he swallowed a sock, which is what golden retrievers do. Um, but by the time we found out what he had, it turns out that he had what was called autoimmune hepatitis, which body, human or pet, uh, the immune system gets triggered to fight itself. And in his case, his liver. So, um, you know, it's just a really upsetting situation and we didn't know how it was triggered. And I had to really think, you know, was it his dog food? contaminated water? Was it pesticides? We live in central New Jersey and we live on a farm. So there's spraying um, of glyphosate and all these other pesticides all around us for many, many years. And then I thought about his dog collar and I thought about all of the, you know, flea and tick medications that we had used. And I thought about this red plastic toy that was in his mouth that would never leave his mouth. So it was in his mucous membranes of his mouth. So it was getting highly absorbed into his body. But at that time, I didn't know anything. So I really was just trying to explore it. And the more I was looking into what might have made him sick, the more I started finding out how unregulated all of our products as human beings in the U.S. are. And it, would, it was blowing my mind. Like I had no idea that cosmetics, um, personal care products, cleaning products in this country are never tested for safety or toxicity before they end up on shelves, which end up in our homes, which end up in our kids and our pets. So, you know, that's really how this whole eight year, 10 year journey began. It was just out of heartbreak. And I write about this in my book. It's all in the introduction. I thought that it was worthwhile doing that so people can understand, you know, sort of this journey, not by choice, but by sort of um, sad desperation. So that's brought me here years later. Now I'm, I'm in a different place. I, I'm the same way. I, I had uh, two dogs. They, they passed already, but I had my beloved Jezebel. And, you know, and I was doing the same thing, trying to figure out like what was going on with their health as well. And what, however, whatever reaches you, whatever kind of wakes you up to uh, this toxic world we're in, I think is uh, to a certain degree, you know, uh, really kind of beneficial or a blessing, you know. So and most of us walk around without any concern because not a lot of the stuff that we're around may be harmful, but it doesn't affect us in any visual way, like a rash. It doesn't make us gain weight visually over, you know, over a short period of time. It doesn't, you know, so we walk around just kind of assuming everything is okay and that the government oversees all of these tests and chemical testing before they go into products. But here in this case, it was just boom, smack in my face that something went wrong. Um, and I would have probably not bothered to dig deeper had it not been for such uh, a jarring moment, you know? Yeah. And, and what is that? So what is going on with chemical testing? Cause I, I thought that too, as a teenager, I thought, Oh, well, you know, this beauty product I'm using, I'd read the ingredients and these all must be safe because the government, you know, and the EPA protect us from chemicals. What is the reality? Are chemicals that are unleashed into our environment every day tested for safety? So we have to categorize them in groups. So for instance, medications are covered by the, by the FDA and they are rigorously tested. So that's perhaps the only thing that's really well tested. Also the word organic or USDA organic is also another criteria given by the government. In fact, in 2012, that has teeth, that actually has meaning, but everything else, all natural, no fragrance, fragrance free, all these things are not actually held up in a court of law or required for third party testing or certification. So we have laws that started in the 1930s, actually 1938, and the food and cosmetic uh, laws of 1938, and then 1958, and all these different, you know, mild revisions, but nothing ever held manufacturers in the United States to requiring testing for safety or toxicity uh, in human beings before they're sent to market. And in, within human beings, there's also pregnant women, 
people with autoimmune diseases or dysfunctional immune systems, children. And so none of this has ever been tested. And so in fact, when things go to the market, such as cleaning products and personal care products and our food additives, which there are over 11,000 food additives, not tested rigorously before going into food systems and food packaging, um, if they end up causing harm, if there's enough of a, a groundswell where there's some product that's causing harm, you remember maybe the hair products that cause people's hair to come out. Uh, the only way they're removed from the shelves are if the manufacturer removes them from store shelves. It is not even our government that has the power to do that. And it's just so crazy when you think about it, because you, you think that food additives and beauty products and other things that you're using are safe. And they, it's, it's really just a self-regulation, essentially. Right. And we love our stuff. I mean, you know, Americans love their stuff. I love my stuff. You know, if you think about just cleaning products, there's literally a cleaner. It's a billion dollar industry. And we do a whole overview on this in the book. You know, it's a billion dollar industry that, that has just exploded even more so because of the pandemic. And now you have this fear factor coming in as well, which is adding a whole plethora of untested, very harmful disinfectant chemicals. Not saying that to downplay um, co coronavirus or COVID, but there are certainly um, judicious ways to use these more heavily astringent type of, uh, you know, disinfectants than really just cleaning products that can be very safe if you choose wisely. But we have cleaning products for doorknobs and light switches and this material and that material and windows. And like, if you break down every component of your home, carpet powders, and, uh, you know, it's just like a huge market for cleaning when really all we need is like white vinegar, clean water, a little essential oils that are organic, a little lemon juice, maybe some sea salt for scrubbing. You know, it's we need to go back to the baking sodas, to the grandma's choices, you know, and not get really, you know, sucked into this groundswell of fear and just assuming that all of these products are safe because I'll tell you they are not in many, many ways. And I can go into that in terms of how they can be health issues. Yeah, the whole coronavirus, you know, uh, decontamination frenzy drives me nuts. I avoid the hand sanitizer. I'm like, I wash, soap and water is enough. It's enough for the, the flu virus. It, it kills everything. Just soap and water. Oh, yeah, you know soap, I mean? water in 20 seconds because time yes. matters. Yes. But it really, that's, soap really just breaks it up and moves it away. Disinfectant kills things. But also with disinfectant, they tend to be antibiotics or things that will cause you know, bacterial resistance in the future. And that's a big sell is people think that an antibacterial component is actually going to kill a virus. Antibiotics don't kill viruses. So there's a whole bunch of marketing. I wish I had the product that my sister-in-law was, was saying everyone's buying like crazy, microban maybe. It, it raves about antibacterial ability, but guess what? Coronavirus is a virus. And then if you look at the inactive ingredients, forget the toxic active ingredients, which again, likely have never been tested for safety. Um, and are likely problematic, which we can go into some specific ones that have been tested. The inactive ingredients, which are on the bottom of the bottle, are filled with chemicals that can even be more toxic. I'll show you, there's one type of cleaning. Let me just give it to you. Another type of anti-COVID um, process is just isopropyl alcohol. And isopropyl alcohol, if it's 90% or greater in terms of, con actually 70% or greater in concentration, and if you look closely, in active ingredients is isopropyl alcohol, inactive ingredient, water. Yeah. <laughs> so even something like that, which I carry this around in my pocketbook, everywhere I go, I spritz everybody. People don't even know I'm coming. Yeah. But the idea is that that is just as easy and better than even a hand gel sanitizer because there's so many inactive, gooey chemicals that cross through the skin barrier, the dermis of the skin and get into bloodstreams. So we really yeah. just avoid that. 
Yeah, your skin, it's like you, you, anything you put on it, it's just, you're mainlining it into your bloodstream and, and causing so many issues. And yeah, I, I hate all the disinfection going on, the, the airplanes, the hotel rooms, everything's been disinfected for your safety. But you know, our bodies were designed over millions of years to deal with bacteria, to deal with viruses. They were not designed to deal uh, with the onset. They, I mean, they can deal with, you know, some heavy metals and whatnot, but they're they just are not equipped to deal with the level of chemicals and disinfectants and things that we are, you know, just bombarded with every single day. And this is, in fact, one of the reasons why I got divorced from my ex-husband is because he was a germaphobe, and uh, and I just was so the exact opposite of that. He was constantly disinfecting everything and wanted all these chemicals, and I'm like, I can't, I can't live like this. It's so unhealthy. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, and and quite frankly, you know, you can get real, especially if you don't really have a background to kind of diffuse some of the hysteria. Area, you know, you can go nuts. And, you know, for instance, I was years ago, I was looking for tile sealant in our bathroom we were renovating and they were promoting, I think it was Bacterban. Uh, it was a type of antibiotic that's actually used in humans for actual infections. They were infusing it into tile sealant and saying that that's a great way to keep your bathroom antiseptic. And I thought to myself, that's insane because you're going to walk around a bathroom uh, basically creating bacterial resistance because, again, bacteria, when they're exposed to antibiotics, will often mutate so that they're actually not going to be effective if you went in, went in if you actually need, a, you know, an antibiotic. And so here you are dousing yourself in an antibiotic on a daily basis by walking on these tiles or, you know, the sealants. And it's just, we've missed the mark in terms of, you know, understanding it. And it's also, we've been overloaded by, you know, the marketing of the industry, which is just so lucrative that we have to hold, we have to pull back. And in terms of the numbers, I figure I'd just throw a couple numbers at your audience. And, and maybe you know this, Wendy, is, you know, we have over 90,000, we're up to 90,000 commercial and industrial chemicals, basically all chemicals that can be used in products in the U.S. market right now. We have over 800 and known endocrine disrupting chemicals, which BPA is one of them. Some of your audience members may remember BPA or bisphenol A in baby bottles that was removed because of its endocrine disrupting capability in children. So they got it off the market in plastic baby bottles in 2012. But there are over 800 of those, including pesticides in that group, including cosmetic chemicals, including food additive chemicals. We have over 15... Uh, polymers that are patented every week in this country. And so you can see it's like a whack-a-mole. We can't really even catch up even if regulation were to change, which it hasn't. Even if the proposed regulation were to require testing, the actual working number is 10 chemicals per year to evaluate for safety by the EPA. We have 90,000 chemicals. So you can see this is never going to work. And which is why, you know, I felt very compelled to write this book about, and I'll hold it up, it's called Non-Toxic, it's called Guide to Living Healthy in a Chemical World, and it's the book that I wish I had 10 years ago without having to figure it out over a 10-year period, and really it's because we have to do it for ourselves. We have to empower ourselves and our teenagers and our kids and everyone to be able to look up your cosmetics on vetted websites to see which are safe and which are not so safe and make choices that are good for us. We need to look up water filters and get clean water systems for ourselves. Or, you know, we need to look at furniture and how to read a label to see whether a couch has flame retardant chemicals, which are endocrine disruptors. So I wanted people to do it themselves, rely on their ability to look it up themselves and not wait for government to improve the system that's not, it's not actually working. No, I mean, they do a much better job in Europe and even Russia at, uh, you know, protecting their, their citizens from, from various toxins. And the U.S. is, I think, the, the lobbyists and the big corporations or our government's very bought and paid for uh, by these big corporations that are protecting their interest and not protecting the interests of the citizens. Mm -hmm. And that's true. And you're in California, um, is ahead of the game, Ca uh, Canada, Europe. I don't know much about Russia and what I do know, I'm not so thrilled about, but in terms of, you know, even their vaccine issues. But I would say, so I can't speak to it, but I know that, you know, in Europe and the EU, they have a much more rigorous process by, you know, by vetting the chemicals that go into their cosmetics. And 
they have taken over 1,200 chemicals out of their system, which they were allow in their products, cosmetics and cleaning and all that. Whereas the U.S. hasn't done that. We, the United States has re, re, uh, removed five chemicals from its market since 1976. Wow. You know, I didn't know that. I think that's, that's incredibly shocking. And some companies will actually formulate shampoo, conditioner, and certain cosmetics for the U.S. market with the same bottle front as they'll do for Europe without all those chemicals because they don't want to reformulate what they've already created because there's million dollars of, you know, R&D and figuring out how to do that. So, you know, we now know that there are two different products that have different chemicals that are sold to two different markets. So, you know, it's pretty insane. And again, you know, it goes back to the idea is that we can reduce chemicals that actually get into our bloodstream, our urine, our breast milk. We can actually reduce those. There's plenty of great studies that we talk about in the book that give people an idea that when you switch to say organic produce, you can lower the pesticide residues that are found in blood and urine. And this has been tested particularly in migrant farmers and their children, but also in everyday folks. And so, you know, people who aren't working in those industries. So there's gotta be studies to show that when you make lifestyle changes in very reasonable ways, which is what I'm all about, is easy, practical, reasonable, not costly ways to make these switches, that you can lower those exposures, which in fact lead to less inflammation in the body, because there's studies on inflammation based on certain chemicals that we now know, and also not just live longer with less chronic conditions like diabetes and obesity and heart disease and in kind of endocrine-related, hormone-related issues, cancers, but also reaction to COVID infection. So that is actually really key is what is your baseline level of inflammation that you walk around with and does that prime your immune system to a worse response when you are exposed to any virus, but particularly now COVID virus. Can you talk a little bit more about toxins and immunity? Because that's a hot topic right now. Because you know, I talk, I focus more on heavy metals uh, on my site and, and how I, I talk about how that affects the body. And we know that mercury, lead, cadmium, and arsenic have a very devastating effect on immunity and immune function and immune cell function. Can you talk about chemicals and how they affect the immune system? Yeah, so the chemicals that have been tested, again, you know, these are done by university institutions internationally with shared, you know, databases, but there are a limited number of chemicals or groups of chemicals. So we have phthalates that are in plastics. We have BPA, which is a plastic epoxy coating for canned foods. And so, yeah, these are uh, groups of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Now, the endocrine system, which is our hormones, which many people will think of thyroid hormone, fertility hormones you know, uh, puberty hormones, testosterone, um, and estrogen. But we also have hormones like insulin. Insulin is a hormone. It's a messenger. Hormones are just messengers that are very, very tiny in terms of their amount that cause really kind of exponential physiologic changes. Uh, they're messengers that are very vulnerable. And the endocrine system is not completely siloed or separate from the immune system. In fact, they're very much connected. They interact with each other because those hormones affect the immune system's function as well as messengers. And so when we think of endocrine disrupting chemicals, there are many of those chemicals that have also been found like bisphenol A to affect the immune system in terms of inflammation. And then of course, endocrine disruption can cause risk for chronic diseases that are very inflamed, such as diabetes, obesity, uh, you know, heart disease, autoimmunity, infertility, which is a very big deal. So, you know, they're connected and it's, it's kind of hard to, you know, we do this in the book in, in, one, in the first chapters to kind of show people how intricate and the connections and how this might work. But we're talking about, if you look at it like an army and soldiers and generals, there's a whole hierarchy of commanders all the way down to the soldiers and they're all telling people what to do and, and what these soldiers should do. And when you have chemicals that mimic those soldiers or mimic those generals, then you're getting all this disruption and the messaging is all getting screwed up. And that's how we know that uh, fat cells enlarge from endocrine disrupting chemicals, many of them. So despite a good healthy diet, if your salad is in plastic and you're getting all these hot plastic foods that are you know, dietary, 
you may still gain weight because the plastics are actually affecting your fat cells despite a healthy diet. Oh, let's talk about that a little bit more because I think that's something that uh, really piques people's interest. And, you know, I personally believe and know from the research that, you know, this uh, obesity epidemic that we have in the United States and growing around the world, diabetes is growing around the world, that uh, metabolic syndrome, it's not just the amount of food that people are calorically eating. It's much more than that. Can you fill us in on that? Yeah. And that's where a lot of this hormone disruption can come in. Uh, it shows basically what we're seeing is that despite food changes in terms of, um, you know, when you hold those things, um, you know, stable, say calorie content, uh, quality of their food in terms of, you know, fats, proteins, carbohydrates, the, the research is really panning out that it's not just, you know, how many, sat how much saturated fat or sedentary lifestyle, but it's the chemicals that are in the processed foods that we eat. So whole foods tend to have least amount of chemicals, or they may have pesticides from growing them in fields. We want to get those pesticides off. We want to make sure that we have the least amount of pesticide residue on and in the fruit. So organics are great, but you can also wash lots of fruits and vegetables, soak them in baking soda, white, white vinegar with warm water and agitate it. So we want to get those chemicals off because it's not just the quality of the food that may be making people, um, especially processed foods, gain weight, but it's the way those chemicals affect fat cells. They direct stem cells, which are the beginner cells in our bone marrow, to come out of bone marrow and grow into fat cells, and they make fat cells enlarge and decrease um, variably. So, um, you know, they affect insulin and how insulin breaks down glucose. If they do disrupt the hormone insulin, you can affect obviously how, you know, how efficient glucose is broken down. And so that's metabolic syndrome. And so there's these chemicals that are having this effect that are so different than just saying, okay, yeah, I'm cutting back on, you know, fats or I'm cutting, I'm increasing my protein. That's just a category. That's not necessarily looking at the quality of the food and the amount of processed chemicals in there. Another aspect which I, I would like to mention is that, you know, the gut microbiome, which is all of the, you know, the bacteria, the virus, viruses live in there, molds, yeast, and they're supposed to live there all balanced. And they're part of our evolutionary system for millions of years. And when you disrupt this balanced microflora of the gut, it has been shown that it can disrupt how we break down calories, how we distribute and pull out nutrients from food. And so the big mantra, the big movement in you know, holistic health, integrative functional medicine is really to how do we maximize the health of the gut so that then the gut is good to us in terms of our immune system, our endocrine system, and even our weight. So we wanna make sure we have good, healthy, whole foods. We wanna avoid chlorinated, unfiltered drinking water. You want to avoid processed chemicals and foods because many of them, not just pesticide, but colors, preservatives, uh, emulsifiers can get into, you know, disrupt the gut as well, the microbiome. So uh, stress, stress can change the pH of the gut, proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole for reflux. All of these disrupt the normal evolutionary balance of the gut. And I think when people start to get that in order, they may see some really good benefits to um, cleaner eating for their weight and for their health condition risk. You also talk about liver health and how poor liver function can contribute to weight gain and uh, the epidemic of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And, and even, you know, there's, you know, estimated a hundred million people have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But beyond that, there's people with poorly functioning livers, overwhelmed livers, it isn't like a clinically diagnosable illness. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, liver, our liver is a really critical uh, organ in the human body um, for a variety of reasons, because we also, you know, our body manages blood clotting or not blood clotting through the liver factors. But we also have this detoxification system, you know, stage one and two conjugation, which in fancy terms is essentially the way we process chemicals that we're able to at this point in evolution to break them down and kind of get them out of the body or make them inactive. You know, it's just as important to make them inactive as it is even to get them out of the body without causing harm during that time period. So we have other detox components of the body. The kidney is another one. Our lymph system is really able to pull chemicals around and out of the body. Even our brain, our cerebrospinal fluid, the fluid in and around our spinal cord and brain 
clears chemicals at night. We have really cool studies from 2013 and 14 that really started the whole understanding that at night while we sleep, we're actually getting rid of chemicals. It's kind of a rinse cycle of getting it out of our brain fluid. So therefore, sleep is not just for cognition and memory and feeling good and and feeling rested, it's really also to utilize the cleansing process at night. Um, but you know, the kidney and the liver and the lymph nodes um, and the cerebral spinal fluid, all they really do is prove that we have evolutionary processes that are innate to the human body, which we talk about in the book in the detox chapter, kind of to give people an understanding that you can exercise aerobically and fill the liver with blood. We know that that increases blood flow to the liver, which can help cleanse the liver. We know that um, sleep, of course, going to all of that and how to maximize sleep for chemical detox. Sauna is also another way. Sweating, our sweating system is really important because it can really, you know, get rid of a lot of chemicals through the skin. And so these are all really important aspects of how to make the liver and all of our parts really work for us and utilize that, that evolutionary detail. And so really, that's why we try to emphasize the stuff that we have instead of looking for things like you know cleanses and rinses and products to really do what our body does best, which it does clean itself quite well. Okay, fantastic. And so let's talk about pregnant women. I mean, you talked about toxins affecting fertility and hormones. Um, why are pregnant women uh, definitely more at risk for health issues when it comes to toxins and even young children? Yeah. Uh, and one more point I just forgot to make is that alcohol in terms of the liver, certainly alcohol gets broken down through the liver. And really, I mean, not that I love to say this, but alcohol is poison to the human body. I happen to love that poison on occasion, <laughs> especially a really good organic beer or wine because I always get organic, which is available now. And we actually have a whole section on alcohol in the book to talk about how you can choose really healthy wine and beer. But technically our body within reason, within moderation, can manage that kind of poison, uh, fortunately for all of us during a pandemic. But we really need to take it in moderation because again, even the liver can get overwhelmed between medications that it has to break down, uh, between environmental chemicals, between uh, alcohol. All of this is meant to go through the liver and really that can cause a lot of stress and that's how we get fatty liver. So that's why I say the more you pull those away, even sugar, the more you can pull those away and limit them, then any one of them can cause the least amount of harm is the hope. You know, here's to 2021 and re resolutions. But um, in terms of pregnant women, this happens to be one of my favorite topics because so much of how we develop in our health as adults comes from exposure in utero, believe it or not and as children. And this is a really tough pill to swallow for most of us because we don't always have the opportunity to go back in time and, and do it better. I don't, you know, I didn't know any of this stuff when my kids were born. I was doing a little better. I think just instinctively trying to reduce junky food during pregnancy, definitely not drinking. But I think I would have done it so much better now that I know what I know. And that's what you have to go on is empowerment and moving forward. We have a whole chapter on actually what to think about, what to do and what to know during pregnancy, before pregnancy, and even after pregnancy with young children. So I want people to know any stage along the way you can intervene because what you know, you know, and, and you do better. Um, the, diff the issue with pregnancy, which is just so critical, is that the placenta doesn't protect a growing infant, a growing fetus, particularly their brain, which is so sensitive during you know, fetal growth. And the vast majority of these chemicals have been shown to be in fetal blood. In fact, there was a 2005 study that looked at 10 random newborns and they looked at the cord blood right after birth and they found over 200 industrial chemicals in the cord blood of these newborns, which means the mother was exposed obviously not intentionally, but this is the world we're living in between air pollution, between you know, lotions, creams, and cosmetics, tampons uh, that we're putting inside our body as well as on our body, as well as the food. And then of course, unfiltered water, which is an enormous source of contamination that not many people really think about too much. Um, but pregnant women, unfortunately, have this enormous job of growing a fetus and trying to stay healthy themselves, but it's also this added burden 
to try to, I would hope, you know, people who read this book or at least are getting into this topic would know to, to really stop, avoid the chemicals that they don't need, air fresheners, carpet powders, all these extra chemicals that do end up getting into, onto their skin, into their blood, even into breast milk and crossing the placenta into a growing fetus. We have over 250,000 neurons are created every minute during a nine month pregnancy. 250,000 neurons are created every minute during a ten, nine month pregnancy. So that is an area where vulnerability is the highest. And so we just wanna think about that and getting it right. So no blame, no regrets. It's just about moving forward and doing better whenever we can. Yeah, and given that aluminum is known to kill neurons and they're very excitatory, I recommend invite, you know, avoiding anything uh, that has aluminum like as much as you can. And so let's talk about teenagers. So teenagers are, have their own particular vulnerabilities. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, so this is an area that I love to talk about because this is where I want to focus my work, my education moving forward, having done pilot projects to see whether or not teenagers are interested in this topic. So this is what I discovered about teenagers. Well, what we know about teenagers is it's one of these very vulnerable periods where endocrine system activity is at its highest, right? You know, raging hormones. That's what we think of when we think of teenagers, you know, labile moods, their bodies are changing, their voices are changing, their moods are terrible or great, depending on what day of the week. Uh, and so the idea is that because this is an enormous shift in, in hormone regulation and development and creation, as, long, as well as in utero and toddler years and even menopause, these are called vulnerable periods of human development when it comes to endocrine disrupting chemicals because it can affect the endocrine system that's active at that time. So this is a really important time period uh, where these chemicals could in fact have their most, you know, their, their subtle but um, greatest effects. Interestingly enough, teenagers as a demographic use the most personal care products daily than any other demographic. So they on average use 15 to 17 products daily, you know, shampoo, conditioner, body spray, all whatever you name it, um, as compared to adult women who use on average 12 products a day and men who use six on average per day. So teenagers are not just using the most potentially toxic chemicals because there's a way to look them up, which I do with my high school students. You can look up products on a vetted website and you can really look to see which products are safe, safer, better choices. But they're also tech savvy. They know how to make their way around computers and great websites and resources. They're body sensitive, body vulnerable, very, very self-conscious. So there are a lot of them really want to know what they are putting in on and around their bodies. They're very proactive on that. Um, they use the most chemicals, so we want to get them to be safer if we can. They're also one day going to potentially have children. So what they do with their bodies, how they prep their bodies, how they clean up their bodies prior to pregnancy um, in the future is really good information. And they also may want likely vote one day, right? We hope. And voting is a big deal because it can determine who leads this country in terms of environmental exposure regulations, such as drinking water, such as air quality. And so all of these together make teenagers for me the most vital demographic to reach among all of them, but certainly teenagers as well. Uh, and I've found that they are more than interested in this topic, and I'm hoping to get a national curriculum on environmental health into schools um, in the future. I love that. I love that so much. I just, I applaud that, that effort. Um, you know, I hadn't really, I hadn't really thought about that demographic using more chemicals. I know when I was a teenager, I was doing it, using every cream and mask and hairspray and makeup and constantly, you know, you're obsessed with your, you know, a lot of kids, yeah. uh, young girls are obsessed with their appearance and looking good. And so they're using more products. So that's a, a great insight. And I, I'm, I'm excited that you're, you're focusing your work on that. And even African-American young women, we have a section on that as well, because the data, even within the demographic of teenagers, African-American women and young girls are actually marketed to, you know, in a big way, many, many endocrine disrupting chemical products, such as there's placenta in some of these hair products. 
Um, and this is a real problem. It's shifting their uh, puberty earlier, earlier onset of periods for all young girls, but particularly African-American young women. Uh, and it's a really critical demographic within a demographic because the more you're exposed to estrogen over a lifetime, the higher your risk of breast cancer. So, you know, these are really, you know, topics even within high school students that I think people would appreciate even amongst their colleagues and their, you know, their classmates. Absolutely. And Amer African-American women are usually getting their hair done every week with, you know, straighteners, with formaldehyde, and all these really, really toxic products and colorings. And, and, and so many women color their hair, too. I mean... It's just and nail uh, products. Yeah. I mean, we have all women love their nails going yeah. every two weeks. And, you know, there's these routines that we, we love, we, we think are normal and healthy. And once you kind of hear about how this stuff gets into our body, you're almost kind of shell shocked. And it doesn't mean you have to stop these behaviors. I want to be clear on that. The whole design of the book was to give options that are equivalent, but safer. You know, the whole goal is to switch out things to safer choices, not necessarily stopping that behavior altogether. And I think that's really important because people don't want to lose the things they love. They just may actually opt into some better choices and know how to do that clearly. Yeah. And the reality is we pick our poison, you know, uh, no matter what you do, what, no matter what you control or you attempt to control, you still are exposed to toxins in the air, food, and water. So you just got, you have to do your best, but you still have to focus on detoxification. Absolutely. So what are your, your top five tips to, to help people to, you know, turn this around and try to and protect themselves and make some changes in their environment? Well, I want to tell you about one thing that I insisted on the book, which is a tear-off sheet. So we have a tear-off refrigerator sheet that actually goes, and I want to say this because there's a lot of stuff that I consider sort of, let me put it in the screen here. You know, we, I want people to do this. It's a journey. So, you know, I don't, it's 10 years in and I'm still fighting over things I don't want to give up, like hair coloring. And, you know, I'm still battling out on a personal level. I've gotten rid of my third couch in our house after 10 years that I knew had flame retardant chemicals, but we just didn't have the money to just throw another couch around for a couple grand. So I think people need to realize this is a journey to begin with. And so whatever you do is worth it and a good thing and you just keep moving on the journey. So the top couple of things, even though there's many, the top couple of things are don't buy stuff if you don't need it. You know, think about all of those cleaning products that we are spending so much money on that if you just stop buying them, you would save a fortune and you wouldn't bring bringing these chemicals into the home that you spend 12, 14, even 18, 24 hours now with the pandemic. So you're really absorbing them through the air quality on dust, which is incredibly toxic and filled with chemicals from all the products that we use. So you want to really just don't buy stuff that you don't need. Go back to old fashioned ingredients. White vinegar is great to have at home. You know, sea salt, baking soda, borax, you know, uh, Castile soap, uh, lemon juice. All of those things are super appropriate for cleaning. Isopropyl alcohol for disinfection in terms of virus. But really just the less is more approach in terms of cleaning products is really a huge jump. So that's the first thing. The second thing I would say is try to avoid processed foods, you know, by, by consumption, food and water. We want to think about going the least processed foods possible. Stick to the outside of a, a supermarket where all the fresh foods, all the refrigerated things are, because that means there's less likely to be preservatives if they're refrigerated, especially salad dressings. Uh, but the idea is to have whole clean foods or at least wash off your produce from pesticides. And the third thing that I really emphasize, and I'll give you a couple more, but is drinking water. Everyone really should consider a filter for their water system. They don't have to be expensive. And they range in terms of how aggressive they are. You can have a pitcher filter, like a Brita or a Zero water, that's called a carbon block filter. But it tends to be limited in how much it can take off of, of water because it runs through that block so quickly. Then you have this opposite extreme, which I recommend called a reverse osmosis water system that actually water goes through so slowly that it has its own tank to fill up uh, during downtime. So, you know, that's the most aggressive thing you can buy on the market and they run $250, $300. 
I get mine and recommend to patients, companies like in California that actually manufacture all of the parts in the United States. And I'll give you that name if you want to put it on your website. I just don't actively promote any brands at all. But the idea is an RO filter is really critical. They cost so, in, they're 250 to 300. They're right in your kitchen sink just for cooking and drinking. Uh, and the plumber costs 150 to put it in in one hour only. And it's about $40 a year to change out those cartridges that anyone can do, okay? So that's a system that I think is critical for anyone who drinks water, period. Fourth thing is probably to dust. Dust is so heavily laden with chemicals that come from carpeting and you know, couches and cleaning products and all that stuff. So, you know, if you can't clean up those products, you at the very least want to get the dust off the floor where kids put it in their mouths and pets have it on their paws and they lick their paws. So again, exposure and dust is pretty worthwhile to, to wipe with wipes that are water, not chemical-based wipe, which is a, a silly mistake people make, but I understand it. You just don't want to buy commercial wipes. You just need paper towel and water. And then I would say plastics. Heated up plastics are really not good for any human body. So you don't want to put your food or drinks in any hot plastics. You want to switch to glass or stainless steel. Right here, I have my stainless steel mug. I don't even have a, um, a plastic lip to it. I actually have to take it off so that this is the only thing that I, I touch when my hot coffee or tea is, is going down. And once you change out these kind of things, this was one time I bought three of them and they're, you know, that's it. So once you change out and swap out some of these styrofoam, you know, plastic containers and lids, you know, you're done. So um, those are the big ones, I would say. I could go on and on. You know, radiation, we have a whole chapter on cellular technology and cell phones and Wi-Fi. And, you know, it's not to say get rid of it all. That's not realistic, especially now with the pandemic, everyone's home, kids, my kids are remote. It's really to say, how do we use all these tech toys safely? And there's tons of really easy ways to manage tech toys. I don't let my boy put their cell phones in their pockets near their sensitive genitalia. I say, I want to be a grandmother one day. You know, we, we need to think about radiation in terms of closeness to the body, be it the head, be it the breast. You don't want to carry them in your, your bra. You don't want to put them in the front pockets of your pants. You really want to turn them off. Airplane mode is really critical. So there's lots of good, you know, tips in that chapter to explain why there's a problem and then what we can do about it. Yeah, I mean, it, Realm was a built in the day. You know, you, you have to learn about this stuff and pick off the lowest hanging fruit first, you know, what you can have the time to do and what you have the, the money to do. Uh, it can be overwhelming, but you know, I, I like to have the simple guide. There's certain places you want to start first before you get more advanced. Let's talk about the kind of like the topic that you're most passionate about, that you're, you, you're most concerned about when it comes to chemicals. Yeah, I mean, having done this for a while and having taken myself off the ledge many times of panic, you know, because the more I read, the more I get upset about it, but then I kind of try to put it in a practical perspective and realistic perspective. But I do believe water, drinking water is highly underrated when it comes to concern. And when I look back and think of all the restaurants I sit down in and just people plop water on your table and you drink it, and you know, you just don't think about where it came from. Is it well water? Is it municipal tap? I mean, at least municipal tap water, which is a horrible, you know, at least, but 91 chemicals are, you know, regulated, meaning, you know, they find those chemicals, those 91 chemicals, and they're too high in the treatment plant, they'll remediate it, okay? That goes for benzene, arsenic, that kind of thing. However, and these are 160,000 water treatment plants in the U.S., okay? And they serve about 85% of the U.S. population. So most of us get our drinking water from municipal tap treatment or city water, so to speak. But they're only required under the Safe Drinking Water Act of 1974 to manage these 91 chemicals when we have 90,000 that can get into that water and do get into that water. Sewage, you know, manufacturing chemicals, farming chemicals, runoff, leakage, coal ash. I mean, the list goes on and on. So what I really think people should consider, if there was one thing I would wish for people in the new year, actually, is just by volume and how much we drink and feed our children water, uh, really to consider a water system that makes them feel good, that you don't have to go out and buy plastic water bottles, which feeds plastics into the water, 
It saves money. It's better for the planet. Uh, and really it pays itself off in terms of these bottles that people bring home, which I used to bring home pallets and pallets of plastic drinking bottles because I was afraid of my tap water. Well, now I say, don't even test your tap water. Don't even test your well water. It's, uh, it's not- contaminated, trust it's us. Contaminated. <laughs> we know the punchline. It is definitely contaminated. And if it's, if it's at a level that EPA says is okay, even that's too high, I, I assure you. So I want people to really consider, if there was one thing, consider an aggressive water filter system in your home. You know, even in an apartment, ask your landlord. It can be put in, it can be taken out. But it's not a big deal. And it makes water, it literally just takes everything off of water. And if people tell me, well, what about minerals? And forget it, get your minerals from great, clean, healthy salads and fruits and vegetables. You can replenish with minerals. You can get all that back in, vitamins, nutrients. You don't need it from your water. What you don't need from your water is toxic chemicals and contaminants. And that I think would be the biggest thing you can do, I think individually and for families, even for your pets. I mean, because my pets eat, drink water from that, that water as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, minerals make the water taste kind of nice and have like a nice mouthfeel if you're paying attention. But yeah, and then there's like testosterone in the water and there's, you know, people are there's, urinating out their medications. Yeah, there medication. are medications in the water. It's it's so disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> it's you? because these treatment plants aren't capable. They don't have the modern day infrastructure to remove oral contraceptives, blood pressure medications, antipsychotics, wastewater, fracking chemicals, believe it or not, anything that lands on a stream, a lake, or into the aquifer of soil will make its way into a municipal tap water treatment plant to be cleaned. And mostly what they clean off of it is is really the 91 chemicals, if they can, but then also trees and leaves and dirt and all that. And then what's left is stuff that just was never able to be taken off in the first place. So that will go right out through PVC piping 20 miles to your home. So you got all that piping chemical, you got any breaks in that water line, and then it goes right into your sink. So by getting a filtration system like a reverse osmosis with a carbon component, which they do, you're really cleaning it at the point of use. So it doesn't matter if you have a well, and it doesn't matter if you have tap water. It doesn't matter. The, the water line coming in is what is cleaned. Yeah. And it's also scary to think about, you know, your shower water. That's also a problem. And that's why I advocate for people to get a whole house water filter if they're able to. You know, you want to be absolutely thinking about the water that you're drinking. But even if you're drinking perfectly filtered water, you, you, you want to be, you know, concerned about the shower water too. But shower water, I'll give you, there's a lot of tips in there about shower water in the book, which I'll put Good. up and I'm proud of it. But let me tell you, these whole house filters can really run thousands of dollars. Yeah. And I'm not saying yeah. you shouldn't do it. If you got the money, go for it. We never wanted to, or we couldn't spend the money on that because we had other expenses. So what I recommend in terms of what you just said, Wendy, is you can actually go to a big box store and get a shower, shower head that has a carbon filter in it. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's 17 bucks. We talk about this in the, in the book, in the water, drinking water chapter. You can actually replace that every six months and it'll be far cheaper than $6,000. Yeah, absolutely. And, they, and, and it'll get a, you know, a lot of stuff, which is yeah, great. Chlorine and a lot of chlorinated water. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so, so tell us where we can learn more about your work, learn more about you and what, what you do. And you have a podcast too. Yeah. So um, that just started. So I has, I started a platform out of frustration along with a lot of other frustration I had with, with not understanding this material, not knowing why I didn't learn it in med school. I started a platform called The Smart Human. I wanted people to, you know, realize that we're all humans and that's a, a defining, you know, a common denominator. So it's called The Smart Human on Facebook, and Twitter and Instagram, and of course the website, thesmarthuman.com. And then also the podcast is on Apple iTunes and other places you can podcast, and it's called The Smart Human. And essentially it's a environmental health and prevention platform. And I teach and share Monday, Wednesday, Friday on Facebook, which I'm particularly proud of because it's pretty straight stuff 
uh, no kitschy stuff, no sales, no endorsements, nothing. Instagram's a little more fun. I post meals that I put together and why they're important, what the nutrients are and all that stuff, little hacks. It's a little more fun and kitschy and, and you know how Instagram is, right? But Facebook is definitely more straight stuff, really cool articles and just, you know, mental health Fridays I have. Mondays are usually sustainability. Wednesdays are usually physiologic nutrition, cancer prevention, chemicals and how they work. So I try to keep it interesting. So I hope people will follow there. And then of course I practice in Princeton, New Jersey. Where are you located? Actually, I am a, I'm in Mexico. So I'm I just- really so pretty outside your window. <laughs> that is definitely not what I'm living <laughs> Yeah, well, I moved from Huntington Beach, California. I kind of was escaping the lockdown. And then I, I moved to Houston, which I was not feeling terribly inspired there, but near my family. Then I, I decided to flee to Mexico and I'm, I, I made a, a, an amazing decision. Super no, happy. Wonderful. So, so I'm stuck here in Princeton until things <laughs> quiet down. Um, but if people want any type of consults or medical um, telemedicine, I do that all over the world. And um, especially now with COVID, I'm doing a lot of vaccine evaluations for people, believe it or not, with immune system problems. Who knew that was going to be a thing, but it is. So people can always reach me through my medical practice, which is Ailey at AileyCohenMD.com. Ailey, A-L-Y at A-L-Y-C-O-H-E-N md.com fantastic fantastic well you guys you heard it that's where to get in talk, contact with dr ailey so again thanks for so much for coming on the show is there anything else that you left out or maybe you wanted to discuss that we we didn't address yet well i'll just mention a couple of things again i'm proud of the book because it took eight nine years it really is my baby i think it's i think it's put together in a way that shouldn't scare anybody it should empower us but i also want to mention some some pretty pertinent topics now vaping I do a section on air quality, indoor and outdoor, but also vaping and some of the health and related issues. If you have teenagers and, and anyone who wants to learn about vaping and what the issues are, uh, I talk about soccer turf. You know, I have two young boys and these are the issues that come up in my life that I have, you know, environmental goggles on. Uh, and I talk about what soccer turf, sports turf is all about, what to think about. I haven't taken my kids off the fields. They love their sports. It's how to manage soccer, soccer turf, and all of these chemicals in a way that's reasonable. And I think that's the sell on this is that it's not to scare anyone or create resistance. It's really to, to try to pull people in and, and empower them in a way that works for them. Yeah, I mean, you, you have to navigate our, our toxic world. It's, yeah, and the, the vaping is such a horrible thing. My, my brother's wife died of cancer, lung cancer last year because she switched from cigarettes to these cheap flavored vapes. Yeah for four years thinking she was being healthier because right. um, they're marketed that way and it, it, it did her in. No I mean, regulation and they're often yeah. more toxic because they get away with flavors and things that have just, again, never been tested for safety, but the ones that are in there have some identifiable harm to them. We know that from some of those ingredients and it's just a wild, wild west. So, you know, there's options, you know, it's just a matter of people, you know, wanting to open up the hood and see what's what's in there for that topic. But again, it's not to scare people away. I have a whole chapter on medications, very common medications like statins and reflux medications. Uh, and also a whole chapter on, on talking about how to manage pain control. As an integrative rheumatologist, I manage pain all the time and I'm trying to give people options other than medication if it's appropriate. And there's so many great ideas there. So um, again, just a different perspective. Uh, so people might be interested. Yeah, I love it. So everyone go out and get the book. It's, it's, uh, I highly, highly recommend it. Tell us the name again. It's non-toxic. It's called uh, non-toxic. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and a bunch of independent store sellers that, um, you know, for small booksellers, I hope they get business too, but it's non-toxic guide to living healthy in a chemical world. And my co-author actually is Dr. Vom Sal, who's a renowned uh, neuro and reproductive biologist. And he was largely, his research was largely responsible for having BPA or BP, bisphenol A taken out of baby bottles in 2012. So oh, wow. I feel very humbled and honored to work with him. He's a well, wonderful person. I would love to have him on the podcast too, if you could recommend Yeah, that. I'm sure he would do it. And he's Fantastic. great. So Fantastic. Yeah, we'll connect you with him. 
Okay, great. Well, Dr. Ailey, thanks so much for coming on the show. And everyone, thanks so much for tuning in to the Myers Detox podcast. It is uh, my pleasure and my honor to be able to educate you every week on this topic that I'm so passionate about. You need to be living that detox lifestyle, doing something every day to avoid or remove toxins from your body. So thanks for tuning in. I'm Wendy Myers of MyersDetox.com. And I hope you've, you've had a wonderful start to 2021. I have so much to look forward to and, and so many amazing topics to, to talk about in 2021. So talk to you guys.